I appreciate Patrick's sensitivity of praying that in the midst of our hurriedness and distraction that we would not miss what God wants to do in the normalcy of our routine. And I'm so grateful for the times that God interrupts me because I don't know a, a season of life where Sunday isn't spent with God's people. I grew up in church as pastor. People like it when the pastor shows up most Sundays. And it's very easy, and I would imagine that you may feel similarly. It's very easy to get in the rut of normalcy, and if we'll be honest, to expect very little. But I can't sing the song we just sang without God every time absolutely gripping me with the phrase that my sin was great and your love was greater. And, and most Sundays, someone will stand here and, and will open God's word and, and walk through a portion of it. And, and it is the, the, the task of the person here, the assumed task to make that interesting in some way to you. We put outlines together and we try to start them with the same letter so you can remember them and, and, and all those tricks that we do. But I can proclaim no greater thing to you this morning except this. Your sin is great, but his love is greater. Friend, your sin is great, but it is not greater and grander than this good and glorious news that Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life and died in your place for you. If that's all you get this morning, then praise his wonderful, beautiful, powerful name that you were drawn to understand the good news of the gospel. That your sin is great, but his love is greater. And that we'll never out -sin his grace for us in Christ. That is good news. That is great news. And God help us for when we get in such a rut that we miss the beauty of the simplicity of the gospel that reconciles us to God. That he loves us, he is for us, he has redeemed us, he has reconciled us, he has drawn us to himself. If you look at all the gospel explanation in the New Testament, he does all of these things. And we are the glad and gracious recipients of them. And so friend, this morning, if you're here and you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation, and I pray that God very tenderly but firmly presses that truth on your heart and on your mind to the point that we can never, ever, ever get over that simple truth. Because we've been talking for the last several weeks that God makes all things new. Week one, we talked about this, that in Christ, we are new creations in him, that we are a new creation. We're a new person because of the good news of Jesus, because of what Jesus has accomplished for us, that we were dead in our sins, but we have been made alive together with Christ, and that in him, we're a new creation. We're a new thing, and that's cause to celebrate. And that in being that new creation, being a new person, he connects us eternally through the commonality of Christ with his people, that we're part of a new people. And that in that relationship with him, uh, that, that we, we are, our perspective is changed from just simply thinking about the years that we have in this place, the bit, that we are called to live with a view for eternity, realizing that God is working things that will matter 10 billion years from now and beyond. 
And this morning, I want us to talk about just what Patrick prayed, that in the midst of our distraction, that we understand that as Christ's followers, we have a new purpose. I want to invite you to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've been in 1 Corinthians 12 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 through this whole series. And this morning we're going to look at the latter part of this chapter. And I want us to understand some things that, are, that, that we can glean from this text that will focus our heart and our mind as we move through this time in God's word and, and, and then we move into a time where we can share communion together. This is one of my favorite uh, things that we do as God's people where we remember and we celebrate through the sharing of communion, uh, the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us where our hearts are pressed deeply into the gospel. And if you are a Uh, a a believer in Christ, a follower of Jesus. You are a redeemed person. You are reconciled unto God through Christ, but not a member at Stuart Heights. You are welcome to participate in communion together. We celebrate what we often refer to as open communion. So if you're a Christ follower, you are welcome to celebrate that today. You are welcome to participate. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, Paul writes, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, and behold, new things have come. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There are five things I want us to see this morning, and I've done my best to create those, this outline in a way that would be easy for you to remember. So we're going to look at five words that start with the same letter because it works. But also because this text lays itself out this way as well. And the first thing that we can see here is that we have been given a new ministry. As followers of Jesus, we have been given a new ministry. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. I want us to just look at that phrase for a moment. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Let's not move past that phrase and not take just a moment to celebrate the good news of the gospel. You who were far off have been brought near through Christ. Every person who's ever drawn breath is separated from God by sin. That is the the, the reality of living as people under the the curse of the fall, that those uh, people who who are living are living dead because they're separated from God by sin. But yet God, through Christ, has reconciled us to himself. That's the beauty of the gospel. That God loves those who have sinned and rebelled against him to the point that he would send his son to accomplish what we could never do on our own. The simple phrase that God loves you is easy to hear and it is easy to compartmentalize, but it is life altering when we understand it. That those, and, and, and especially for those who, who maybe have uh, been brought up under some religious uh, training and, and have been taught good morals, it's almost more difficult for us to actually be convinced that we're sinful and that our sins really have offended God. But that we were in need of being reconciled unto him. But in being reconciled, now there is this thing that he's also given us. He's given us reconciliation, but he's also given us this ministry of reconciliation. That word ministry is is well translated. It is a service. It it, It is something that is rendered unto God. 
He's gifted us this in the, under the foundation of being reconciled unto him through Christ. He's also given us a function that we are to engage in this ministry of reconciliation. Well, we're not the ones who are doing the reconciling. Then what then is our role in this work that God does in reconciling still those who are far from him unto himself? What then is that ministry of reconciliation? He continues to describe that in this ministry uh, of this role that we have we don't have to create the message we don't have to to come up with something clever we don't have to think okay what is the the most important thing that the world needs to know it's simply this not only do we have a new ministry we have a new message what he says namely that god was in christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed, committed to us the word of reconciliation. Look at those two phrases. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and not counting their trespasses against them. I want you to think just of yesterday, or maybe the last couple of days, where you may have not hit the mark spiritually. Where maybe you were a little more like you and a little less like Jesus. We can flowery language it all up that we want. We can try to pretty it up, but maybe we can look at it this way. Let's think about the last couple of days and you make the own list in your head where you know that you sinned and rebelled against God. But as a follower of Jesus, you also know that that is under the blood of Christ and that is not held against you. Friends, I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced of this, that the longer we know Jesus, the more we need to regularly focus and meditate on the simple truth of the gospel. Because we are, by nature, people who left unto ourselves, we will drift away from the basic truth of the gospel. Not that we will believe a false gospel, but that we will appreciate less the reality of the true gospel. Because as people who have been rescued, it's easy for us to begin living in the comfort of one who has been rescued without remembering what it was to be one who needed to be rescued. I think a great way that we can see this is in the life of Gomer Pyle. Do you remember Gomer Pyle? Anybody remember Gomer Pyle? Interesting character because in some episodes he knows nothing about cars. He knows how much gas goes in the tank and he charges you a certain amount for every time the tank goes ding, ding. And then like three episodes later, he's a master mechanic that can fix everything from a freezer to a, a, a Ford. Well, he can't fix a freezer. But he and Opie almost had that thing fixed. But in one particular episode, Andy saves his life. Do you remember that one? Nobody remembers that episode? Works a lot better if y'all watch more Andy Griffith. But Andy saved his life. And, and every person that he encountered, he told the tale over and over about how Andy battled through the flames. It really wasn't flames, but... He told the story and had great gesture. He never lost the zeal of what it was to be one who had been rescued. Now, you probably didn't think this morning when you got here you were going to learn anything from Gomer Pyle except the, 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 the model of this. He never forgot what it was to be rescued and wanted to tell everybody he came in contact with the story of how it happened. Friends, that is the ministry of reconciliation. In a nutshell, that is the ministry of reconciliation. You have been rescued. You have been redeemed. You have been reconciled. God has accomplished for you what you never could do on your own. And you are the recipient of God's gracious activity. And it ought to be not through oughtness of of just this is what we're supposed to do, Christians. Go tell people. But because of our great appreciation and affection and admiration and worship, the gospel ought to be flowing from us because this is the reality. The one who holds our heart is the one of which we speak. You want to know what has somebody heart, somebody's heart? Listen to the things they talk about. 
Listen to the things that, that are threaded through their speech day in and day out. You want to know what has somebody's heart? Listen to what comes out of their mouth. And we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And it's not that we have to come up with some sort of creative thing. Here is the message that God in Christ was redeeming the world unto himself, not holding their trespasses against them. There are billions of people in the world who have never heard that simple truth. We have a new ministry of reconciliation. We have a new message that we also see that we have a new motive, a new motivation. The latter part of verse 19, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He has placed or appointed or given or purposed or set forth or settled upon us or sunken down to us this word of reconciliation. God has laid the gospel upon us. He has given us this responsibility. Therefore, because of these truths, because God has accomplished for us what we could not do on our own, he has reconciled us to himself and he has not held our sin against us and he has given us the word of the gospel. He has laid it upon us and because of these things, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We also have in this text a new mandate. We are ambassadors for Christ. I want us to look at that phrase for just a moment. It doesn't say that we might be. It doesn't say that we can be. It doesn't say that we ought to be. It doesn't say that we should be. It doesn't say we have the opportunity to be. We have the option to be. What does it say? It says we are ambassadors for Christ. To follow Jesus comes with the responsibility to tell others of him, to represent him to the world, to be a representative of, to be one who speaks on behalf of. And we've often said, we've often thought these kind of phrases. Man, if God could have chosen any way in the world to communicate the good news of the gospel to the, to the world who doesn't know it, why in the world did he choose his people? Because that's the way he wanted it. That's the way he designed it. That's the way he put it together. There's not a plan B. There's not an, an option C. There's not a, well, if this doesn't work, I wonder what God's going to do. The responsibility has been given to us. And let's just, let's just be very honest for a minute. There's no... M to go with this. I just want us to be honest. I've not told you anything right now you don't know. If I told you the letter M and you'd given that passage, you probably could have picked seven M's to go with them and picked your top five and put them in there. I've not told most of you something that you've not heard a million times over. And the last thing I want you to do is right now to feel guilty. The last thing I want you to do is go, man, I ought to tell more people about Jesus. I know I should. I know I ought to. Well, I, I, I know I'm supposed to, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I'll feel guilty till about 3 o'clock. And then the, I'm not interested in you feeling guilty because I felt guilty enough for all of us. I'm not interested in you right now feeling bad about yourself. I'm not interested in, in trying to, to muster up a commitment card. I don't have a commitment card under your chair, and I want you to sign it and tell me how many people you're going to witness to this way. I'm not interested in any of that because here's the reality. We've tried those things in the Western church, and they've not worked. I'm not interested in trying to guilt you into some kind of response because when we respond out of guilt, the change in our behavior 
wanes and ends as soon as the emotion of guilt goes away or as soon as that, that presence of the one or the thing who's making us feel guilty goes away, then we go right back to whatever. Here's what I'm interested in for us as a people, and I'm including me in this, that we would be so ridiculously in love with the one who redeemed us, with the one who reconciled us, with the one who rescued us, with the one who saved us, that we would be so tightly and intimately connected with the fact that we are rescued and that we are deeply in love with the one who has rescued us, that you just try to get us to stop talking about Jesus. I'm not interested in guilting you into behavior. I'm interested in whether or not we genuinely are in love with our Redeemer. Because change in behavior means very little if there's not a change in heart. So I want to ask you, do you, do you love him? Not will you memorize an outline and, and fumble through an awkward conversation and, and check off a box because the preacher said you were supposed to. Who has your heart? Are, are we still deeply moved by the truth that our sin was great, but his love was greater? Are we heartbroken for the people that we know that we are sure don't know that truth? Are we moved and compelled, not out of guilt or out of oughtness, but out of this reality that there are billions of people in the world who, who have not read the Bible and found it to be false and rejected it. They've never heard of Jesus. I'm not interested in us just changing be behavior. But then the fifth thing that we can see, that our, our methodology would be different, but not by a different action, but that we would have a new method rooted in a new heart. My guess is if you've been in church for any amount of time, you have been asked, you have been enlisted, you have been guilted, you have been cajoled, you have been named forcibly put on a list of some kind to come to some kind of class where you learn some sort of outline, where you learn some sort of thing, where you learn some sort of gimmick to tell people the best news they could ever hear. If I ask you at five o'clock tonight, how many of you can remember the five M's you just wrote down? 90% of you will give me two. Unless I tell you now, I'm gonna give you a quiz at five o'clock tonight. Then you'll give me four. Now I'm not saying that evangelism training has been a waste. I'm not saying that evangelism training by memorizing an outline and memorizing tools and those kind of things haven't been effective because they have. We've seen hundreds and thousands of people brought to faith in Christ through tracks, through outlines, through this and through that. But the reality is it doesn't matter the method that you use. What matters is the one who has your heart. Because some of you love a good outline and and especially one with the same number of points that you have fingers. I don't do those well. Because I know my tendencies. If I have an outline, I want to remember every point. And if I get to point three and you ask a question, you just interrupted me. Now I've got to go back to point one so I can give you all of them in order because I don't want to mess something up. I'm not good at those. And I'm not good at them, so I don't use them. You know what I love to use to share the gospel with somebody that doesn't know it? A cup of coffee. Shock surprise. A cup of coffee and a table and a conversation that begins something like this. Tell me your story. How did you get to where you are? Tell me, tell me about your family. 
Tell me about the town you grew up in. And then when they answer, genuinely listen. Not because you're looking for your opening, but because you genuinely care about the person across from the table. And listen to their heart. Listen to the things that are woven through the thread of their conversation. And then be willing to talk about the one who has your heart. If you ask grandparents to talk about their grandchildren, it's not tough to create a conversation. If you talk to first-time parents about their, their, their new child, it's not hard to create a conversation. You'll probably get pictures of both because they have their heart. And that's good and right. They ought to. But if you ask a follower of Jesus about the good news of the gospel, it ought to be the most natural thing that falls off of our lips. If we are still acquainted with what it's like to need to be rescued. And if we are still acquainted with the desperation with which we depend upon him. Because this is true. That we are ambassadors for Christ. But listen to the way that Paul describes this. As though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. And he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are new creations in Christ, connected to his people with a perspective for eternity. And that God has committed to us this ministry of reconciliation, that we would be the carriers of the good news of the gospel. We often view that as an obligation and a burden, but I would rather us as believers look at that as a great honor. That God has taken the greatest news the universe has ever known and put it upon his people and said, now go tell people about the one who has rescued you. Go tell people about the one who came and lived perfectly and fulfilled all the law and the prophets and who died in your place and who loves them and desires relationship with them. And I've not told you anything you don't already know. But maybe we've been able to look at it in a different way this morning. Not so much as here's another task for you to do, but rather here is a lifestyle change for us because of our heart's relationship with Christ that we would be so consumed with him we can't help but speak of him. So what do we do? Because I know that we live in a society that wants to know what do we do. We live in a church culture that says, okay, great. Those are great principles. Now tell me something to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to bow your head right now. We're doing everything about the end of the service differently this morning. I hope you're all right with that. But here's what you do. I want you to pray honestly, authentically, not worrying about whether or not you're impressive or that your language is Bible sounding enough. But if right now, you would be honest enough to say, Lord, I don't tell people about you because I'm not sure you have all of my heart. Right now, if there are things that you have elevated above Christ in your life, this is a great time to have a conversation with Jesus about that. And in your conversation with him about that, it would be a great time to repent of that, confess that as sin, ask him to forgive you, and then celebrate the grace that he offers you. 
But maybe your, your prayer is something more like this. Lord, I love you desperately. And as far as I can see, there's nothing that is above you in my life. If there is, bring it to my attention. But maybe this morning you are absolutely rightly related with Christ and there is nothing that's hindering your relationship. But the reason that you've not been engaged in, in conversation with lost people about Jesus is because you are petrified to have that conversation. Stop praying like God doesn't know that. Maybe your prayer ought to be something more like this. Lord, I love you desperately, and will you help me not be afraid to speak of you? Will you in, encourage me and give me boldness and give me bravery and courage to engage in conversations with people, to tell them about you? Maybe there are people that were brought to your mind and to your heart that you know that, you, that they don't have a relationship with Jesus and you are looking for ways to have conversations with them. Maybe you could be praying for that person right now that God would orchestrate things for you to have a conversation to tell them the good news about Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never told anybody about Jesus because you don't know him yourself. And your first prayer would be this, to repent of your sin, to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin and to proclaim him as Lord and Savior and follow him with your life. The way that we're going to end our service this morning is to share in communion together. I'm going to ask our deacons to go ahead and take their place as we prepare to receive communion. I want you to just remain in a moment in prayer, in an attitude of prayer and worship. Again, if, if you're here this morning and you're a, a guest with us this morning and you don't know Jesus yet, I'm going to lovingly and graciously invite you just to, when the plate comes to you, go ahead and pass that by. Because if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, this I don't mean this rudely, but this isn't for you yet. We're not trying to exclude you. We're not trying to point you out. But, but we want to take this seriously. And the whole reason that we share in communion together is because we're remembering the good news of the gospel. We're remembering Jesus offering his body for our sin to be crucified in our place. But this morning, if you've professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, even if you've just done that this morning, when that, uh, the elements come by you, then, then graciously and gratefully receive those. But if you're a follower of Jesus and you're not a member at Stuart Heights and right now you're in right relationship with the Lord because that's the, the big thing. If you're here this morning and you're a Christ follower but there's some place of your life that you're living in open rebellion to him, I encourage you don't share in communion this morning. Paul gives some instructions in 1 Corinthians about not receiving communion in an improper manner and that's not talking about the way that you take it. It's talking about the heart with which you take it. But in just a minute, when the elements are passed, spend some time praying and repenting of those things so that this morning you can, in all fullness, come to the table. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to share in communion together. Lord, I pray that every person in this room would be rightly related with you. And as we receive these symbols that we'll be reminded and, and do this remembering you and celebrating you and glorifying you in this reality that you have made us new and then in eternity you will make all things new. And friends, as we remain in an attitude and a spirit of prayer through this process, we are reminded that when Jesus had gathered with his disciples, when he had come to celebrate uh, the Passover with them as they had gathered around the table, Jesus took bread.